Welcome back to another episode of Japan's Top Business Interviews. I'm your host, Dr. Greg Story, the president of Dale Cunningham Training Japan. My special guest today is Richard Dyke, the president of TGK and many other companies here. Richard, welcome. Thank you, Greg. Thank Good you. Good to be with you. Well, Richard, we are buddies at uh, Rotary, That's Rotary right. Club, That's right. so we've known each other for a long time now. But uh, Talking to you, I realize you've had long experience in Japan and you've had a lot of leadership exposure here in Japan. Before we get into that, though, for a lot of people who may not know you or may not know the companies necessarily that you're dealing with, can you talk about how you got to Japan, uh, what sort of industries, businesses you've run here, and what you're doing today? Well, as a factor of age, I've been here for a long time. But, uh... How many years all that together? Uh, I, my first trip to Japan was in 1965. I always say to most people that's before they were born. <laughs> I don't know about you. Uh, so 1965, that was as a student. And uh, that, was, that was really when Japan was beginning to get real traction as an industrial power. So just fascinating from the beginning. But 65 as a student in Japan would have been pretty unusual, I would think. It, it was fairly unusual. Uh, there, was, there was a small group. But actually, well, uh, my second trip to Japan was in 1969. I was at Kyushu University, and there were only two Americans on campus. So that was even more unusual. Hmm. 65, did you come on a scholarship or something? 65, or? I came with a group uh, from University of California oh. and spent a year here. Uh, that was when I started learning Japanese, and uh, that was my first exposure to Japan. Actually, it was my first time to be out of a very rural section of California to a big city, so there were a lot of changes for me that, uh, that were just fascinated me. And so you graduated in the States and came back in 69? Graduated in the States, and then I went into graduate school, uh, and uh, came here in 69 at Kyushu University, went back to the U.S., and then I spent two years at Tokyo University. So just as a student alone, I spent four years in Japan. Mm. And I did my, I, I did a PhD. I did my PhD on the semiconductor industry in Japan. And that sort of uh, set me on my way. I've essentially been involved with the semiconductor industry in, in one way or another uh, ever since then. Hmm. So how about working in Japan? How and when did you get back to Japan to work? My first job in Japan, uh, I spent four years working under Jack Welch at General Electric, okay. which Jack Welch was a senior vice president at the time in GE, and I was working. It, Jack came out of the materials industry, uh, businesses at General Electric. And for whatever reason, he took this bet uh, on an inexperienced PhD, and uh, I was in charge of uh, building the market for GE's materials business all over Asia, but mainly in Japan. Uh, Jack was just focused on Japan, and there's nobody who focuses like he does. So that was fascinating. Uh, but uh, So you're working directly reporting to Jack at that time? Yeah. I was actually, uh, my boss was reporting to Jack, but Jack took a personal interest in Japan, so essentially it was reporting to Jack. Mm. What I was that like? Oh, what was that like? Uh, it, it, it was what I needed, actually, uh, coming out of graduate school. And uh, uh, I, I could remember a lot of things. Uh, Jack always said, you do what you have to do. Uh, no matter how hard it is, you do what it, you have to do. And I can remember one time Jack was in Japan. We were traveling all over Japan, an exhausting trip, traveling to customers. Uh, we get back. I check him into the Palace Hotel maybe at 10 o'clock at night, and I'm to pick him up again at 8 o'clock the next morning. And once a week, I had to rep write a report to Jack which he got, I mean, this is before email, so wherever Jack was, we sent it by fax to his secretary, and she in turn sent it to Jack. I get to his office at 8 o'clock in the morning, uh, having very little sleep, and Jack said, Rick, 
I didn't get your report this morning. And I said, well, you know, Jack, we were together yesterday. <laughs> you know, and it was 10 o'clock and I have an hour commute. And he said, you do what you have to do. <laughs> and I want that weekly report. And I said, oh, okay, <laughs> we will do it. Uh, so he, he, was, uh, he was aggressive. Uh, he was very customer focused. And uh, for him, you do what you have to do. How did that go down with the Japanese style of business, though, that very aggressive, do what you've got to do, Jack Welch style? It's quite different to the Japanese style. I think uh, the thing is the people in Japan could tell that this man was totally devoted to the Japanese market. The, what... what, what G was under Jack. Jack had a PhD in, in material science. And he was the father of a lot of engineering plastics, also uh, abrasives, super abrasives, and so forth. Uh, Jack was very, Jack said, you know, they had to be successful in the United States, they had to be successful in Japan, and they had to be successful in Europe. And Japan to him was more important than, than Europe. And so he put in the investments in Japan. Uh, he, uh, he picked uh, the distributors. He, he, had, he put in uh, centers where customers could bring their products and, and, uh, and uh, GE would figure out how they would make it with GE materials. So his dedication, I think, was, uh, it came through. And uh, that was good. He was, he was very respected. Uh, what were some of the major things you learned from Jack, apart from you have to do what you've got to do type of thing? It, it was, uh, one of the things was value pricing, because what GE was doing, uh, GE was bringing to market materials that were often uh, not just 10 times, but 50 times, 100 times more expensive than the alternative material. Wow. Like uh, we had uh, super abrasive material, which uh, the alternative would have been, for example, for grinding, would have been aluminum oxide, ALO2. Uh, our material was, was at least 50 times the alternative material. And so trying to bring that kind of a material to market uh, and to prove that it would work, he would, do it, he would do it step by step. And he always said, nobody said it would be easy. This is not going to be easy. Uh, but we're going to, the, the pricing is going to be based on value. And uh, he drove it and it was enormously successful. Hmm. Our, our divisions in GE had the highest gross margins of, of any other division in, in GE, but, but it was bringing value to customers. That was something that even our Japanese partners could, uh, could learn from. And so you had that four years. Was that four years with him because they gave you a different role, or he got a bigger role? Or? Actually, that was four years. Then Jack went on to be vice chairman. So he went from senior, senior vice president. When I worked with him, he went to vice chairman. And in GE, I think there were maybe four or five vice chairmen. And they would pick one among the, the vice chairman to get the chairmanship. So he went on. And uh, within GE at the time, and, and Jack gave me the advice, said, you know, Rick, it's time for you to look for something else in GE. But uh, actually, the way GE worked, you manage your own career. So you go around the company, you look for the openings, you submit your resume. It's, it's like changing jobs in a sense. But GE had gotten out of semiconductors, and I had done a lot in semiconductors. I, I was you know, passionate about semiconductors and uh, and so I decided in looking around GE to change and I went to a, a Boston company called uh, Teradyne uh, 
mm. which was more or less a famous company. Well, it was more or less a startup at the time, actually. Uh, and they made semiconductor test equipment and uh, went to Teradyne and ended up spending 20 years at Teradyne. Now that was in Boston. They're headquarters in they're headquartered in Boston, but I was in Japan. Oh, so you're working for Teradyne in Japan? I was working for Teradyne Japan. So I was working for GE in Japan. Uh, went back to Boston for a time to sort of uh, learn about Teradyne. Uh, but, I, but I had gone to graduate school in Boston, so Boston is is very comfortable for me. And, that's because uh, you went to Harvard, I think. Isn't I it? went to Harvard. Of yes, course. that's right. Very humble of you. Not to <laughs> mention that. Went to that. Yes, the school down the street from MIT. Uh, uh, and um, yeah, that was that was totally different because Teradyne at the time was maybe a sixty million dollar company. And GE at the time was one of America's largest uh, companies. And so uh, I, I really wanted to go to a company where you have a sense for all phases of the company, finance, manufacturing, marketing, sales. And the other thing was Japan was the biggest market. Uh, at the time, it was the biggest market overseas for Teradyne. But as the Japan semiconductor industry grew, Japan came to be bigger than the United States. So. Uh, Japan was live or die for, for Teradyne. Uh, and what, what role did you have finally with GE? What was your sort of position in GE? And then what was the position in Teradyne? GE, I was, respons I was responsible for all of Asia, but the main market was Japan. But were they calling you Vice President Asia or President Asia or something? Uh, I was, I was title uh, my God, that's so, that's so long ago. I was, I was general manager of Asia Pacific or something like that for the materials businesses. Uh, yeah. The, um, but, but essentially, all manufacturing was done in the States, and what we had in Japan was we had uh, centers that did, uh, that helped customers uh, build their products out of GE materials. Uh, so it wasn't really a, it, it was marketing and, and sales. Uh, we used distributors in a lot of areas. It was managing distributors. And how about with Teradyne? What was your position? With Teradyne, it was very different. With Teradyne, uh, from the beginning, uh, I joined Teradyne in 1982, and from the beginning, Teradyne figured out that they had to do engineering and manufacturing in Japan. Just the Japanese market was so big, and our main competitor at the time was uh, became to be called Advantest, and uh, and so to hold on to the market, we really had to have a a substantial presence mm -hmm. in Japan. And do they make you president Japan or something like that? With, with Teradyne, I became the president of Teradyne, Teradyne Japan. I was responsible for all of Asia. But at, when I started, uh, Korea was still very small. Uh, Taiwan was still relatively small. There were a lot of American companies in Southeast Asia, so I had responsibility for Malaysia and Singapore as well. Uh, eventually, I became uh, both president of Teradyne Japan and a vice president of the home office and an officer of the home office. Right. Uh, so I was an officer of the American entity and then the head of, of Teradyne Japan. Mm. So let's progress a little bit with the, the uh, career here and sort of fill in the gaps to where we are today and then we'll come back and talk about leadership a little bit. But what happened yeah, well, to, to go with that, uh, after 20 years at Teradyne, and w those 20 years was under the founder of Teradyne, and so I was working with the founding group of Teradyne. I was with the group when we took the company public uh, and had all the experience of taking a, a fairly startup company up to, when I left Teradyne, it was, it was slightly above a billion dollars. So 60 million to a 60 billion, million to a billion in 20 uh, years with all of what you get from the rewards of an American company with stock options and so forth it was very nice uh, in about 
90, about 2000, uh, Teradyne had decided that there, there was a business in Japan that they felt wasn't growing enough. And uh, they were going to divest it. And so I, I went to Teradyne and I said, sell it to me. And we worked out a deal and I did a managed buyout of a business from Teradyne and, uh, and they sold it to me. So What made you choose to do that though? You're with a company that's growing from 60 million to a billion. You've got a very senior position in the company. What made you decide to jump out? I wanted to have the experience uh, you know, at, at Teradyne, or especially at GE, but at Teradyne too, we had an infrastructure of lawyers, accountants, CPAs, uh, and so forth that sort of took care of a lot of the things for me. I wanted to really have the experience of starting my own operation. Mm -hmm. uh, and I did it from scratch. I, well, uh, if you remember, but uh, 2000, there was a period, 1999-2000, where the IT industry, industry, it, it became a bubble. Uh, that was the growth of Cisco and Sycamore and a lot of companies in the United States. Japan was flat in 1999-2000. That's why Teradyne decided to get rid of this business, because their U.S. business was growing so much. So... 1999-2000 was the year that Sony was laying off people, Hitachi was laying off people, NEC was laying off. It was a dismal year in Japan. It was the Ristora year. Of, uh, that business had uh, about 25 employees. And Teradyne was either going to divest it or close it. And... Uh, I, I looked at the business, I figured out, you know, who, who are the customers for this business, why do they buy from us, and I thought it was a viable business. I first of all tried to convince Teradyne it was a viable business, uh, but the leadership at Teradyne had changed it for whatever reason. Uh, and so I went to the employees and uh, said, we're going to go independent. And Actually, Teradyne at the time made it kind of hard. I had, we had to get out of Teradyne facilities within six months. We had to get out of Teradyne's IT system in such and such a time. Uh, they, they, they really wanted, okay, if you're going to do it, you're going to be independent. So found a place in Yokohama where we would go to, and uh, we needed a factory, found a rental factory, and I went to the employees and uh, said, we're going to go independent. Uh, and I had, the, I had the story for the employees of how I thought we could do it. And we talk, I talked to them, I think, in groups of four or five. And the reaction was pretty amazing. And it's, it's typical of Japanese employees, I think. Their first reaction was not what's going to happen to me, what's going to happen to my stock option, what's going to happen to our profit earning, but what's going to happen to my pension. It was what's going to happen to that project at NEC? What's going to happen to Toshiba? What's going to happen to our customers? Can we pull this off for our customers? And uh, with that reaction, I said, okay, with this group of people, we can do it. But I also could set it up in any way I wanted to. And I, and, and I convinced a, a guy who really knew manufacturing from Teradyne in the States to come to Japan and join in with us. So he, he was our partner. Uh, we did it together. And I made all of the employees who broke off with me shareholders. So I don't want to own the majority of this business. But I said, also, we have to think of what our future is. Uh, probably we're not going to get big enough to have an IPO or to go public, and that's probably not the right thing to do anyway. But if we build a valuable business 
in the future, we might be able to find a company that will want to buy us. They will value what we do. And that is okay, which is not a Japanese way of thinking about things. So I made them all shareholders. I found ways, various ways to do it. Uh, and everybody, uh, you know, secretaries, whatever, uh, all of us who broke off together became shareholders. And I also made uh, all the finances in the business uh, transparent. I'm not in this as a lifestyle business. I don't want to drive a BMW to work. I, this is all going to be transparent. Uh, they will know essentially, they'll, they'll know what my salary is. Uh, I don't care about that. Uh, but other employees don't have to know what other employees' salary is, but we'll make it all transparent. And we'll put together a reward system that will reward success uh, in various ways, and uh, you know, we'll share we'll share what we do. But also, we, going back to Jack Welch, uh, we're not going to get business by crashing on price. <laughs> It was a it was a high technology business. Uh, we're going to sell value to the customers. So I, I you know, there were a lot of lessons. So there I was, with a relatively small. When we started out, it was only an eight million dollar business. Uh, starting from scratch, we op we get to the office. We open up the office. We have our furniture. I put something from my desk into the wastebasket, and then I think, who's gonna empty that wastebasket? <laughs> There's no infrastructure. We have to figure all this out. We're on our own. And did that for 10 years, and that was the most rewarding 10 years. That was more rewarding than anything I had done before. Uh, it was great. But then we got to a point where a large American company was looking for a toehold in Japan, and they started courting us. And we also built a factory in Shanghai. So we had a factory in Shanghai, we had a factory in Japan. We had a fair amount of business in Shanghai, mainly selling to other Japanese companies. And, uh, and so they bought us. And they've done a decent job. All of the employees ended up staying. Uh, but recently, the American company decided to move the Shanghai factory to a, a, uh, to a place actually near Wuhan, where we now have the virus. The employees couldn't move. So all of those employees stayed. But then when they moved the factory, they came back to me and my partner and they said, let's start a company. <laughs> and so, okay. so we're doing it. We're starting another company in China uh, with employees that are loyal and, and, and very good. Uh, so that's, that was an incredible experience. Are you doing business with Japan? Do you really know how things work? Japan Business Mastery provides the answers do you have the right networks and know how to create them? Do you know how to get on the same wavelength with Japanese buyers? Do you know what being trustworthy looks like from the Japanese perspective? Japan Business Mastery is based on more than 30 years experience in Japan and will become your go-to guide. Want to succeed in Japan? Buy Japan Business Mastery now. Just to take it a little bit further than that. In about 2001, I got involved with a private equity fund that was just beginning to start. That's Japan Industrial Partners. And it was a group of, of bankers from Industrial Bank of Japan. And they were doing carve-outs from Japanese companies. This is the same restructuring phenomenon that we saw in 1999-2000. There were a lot of Japanese companies restructuring and getting, getting rid of non-core businesses. So Japan Industrial Partners formed uh, this PE fund to do carve-outs. 
and uh, they brought me on board to help manage some of their portfolio companies. One of their first companies was a company very similar to Teradyne, so I knew the business. Uh, and it was a carve out from uh, NEC. So even after all those years in Japan, I was beginning to see a Japanese company more from the inside. I thought I knew Japanese companies. Uh, and this particular branch of NEC, I had uh, competed against when I was at Teradyne, and I, and I thought they were formidable when they were my competitor. So I was starting to see Japanese companies from the inside. Then we bought a business from JVC, Nihon Victor, uh, a spindle motor business, and I actually took that on uh, as my full-time job. So after we had sold uh, the business that I bought from Teradyne, I became, I, it wasn't my idea to take this on, but we had a real problem with the management that came from JVC. So the fund decided we really had to take it over. And uh, the finger pointed at me. And so I found myself running. That was a fairly large business. That was a, a $300 million business with a large factory in Thailand. So I found myself running a sizable Japanese company uh, with a operation in Thailand of 5,000 uh, direct labor. Uh, and how about your original company? You, you said, I think it was... Um I think you said it was eight million. That went from eight million up to up to fifty million. Up to so we grew it. We grew it over a period of ten years, eight million to fifty million. All of our customers were uh, mainline Japanese companies. Now you're running a three hundred million dollar business. And they're running a three hundred million dollar business. Well, uh, Teradyne, yeah, uh, that I I don't think it was. Scale, uh, scale matters, uh, and looking out at a sea of 5,000 uh, Thai girls doing assembly is, uh, is a challenge. Uh, a couple of things, though, that when I was doing my PhD thesis on the semiconductor industry in Japan, and then later again at Teradyne, uh, I became a huge fan and still place a lot of value in the Japanese approach to a manufacturing operation. And so I felt fairly confident that, uh, that using the Japanese approach of quality circles uh, putting the tools in the employees' hands so they can uh, figure out what needs to be done in quality and productivity uh, really works. And it, I, I come from the generation at Teradyne, at Teradyne beginning in about the 90s when... America sort of lost confidence in itself. And this was a period where good American companies went back to sort of discover what the Japanese were doing well. We went through a thorough training effort in, in Teradyne, all over Teradyne in the world, to learn Japanese approaches to manufacturing and also Japanese approaches to engineering. Uh, and that that I find is very effective, not only in Japan, but it was very effective in Thailand and also in our China operation. And so you've continued on with these companies with the Japan Industrial Partners. So with Japan Industrial today, Partners, yeah. Japan Industrial Partners, we started out with a small fund of about eighty million dollars, and now we're up to uh, our most recent fund. Fund is one point five billion dollars. So that's a sizable jump. Yeah, it's a sizable jump. We we we're on our fifth fund. So uh, and we've done twenty five carve outs. Uh, 
uh, we have tended to specialize in carve-outs. A lot of them are businesses that I uh, don't know very much about, although I've I've learned something. We owned Scarlark, uh, Skylark for a while, the Skylark uh, restaurant chain. Family restaurant chain. Yes, and took that public. Uh, we bought Sony's Vio computer business, mm. and it's now profitable. Uh, and uh, we owned, uh, we, we, we've done a lot with NEC. We bought NEC's Big Globe, which was an internet supplier. Uh, so we've we've bought a lot of businesses. Usually, if it's something in electronics or manufacturing, I I get heavily involved. And then I'm also on the board of Hitachi Chemicals, which is another experience at looking at a Japanese company uh, from the inside. Mm. Uh, Fascinating journey here, even though we've known each other. Yeah, okay. <laughs> so many years. I think we've actually got down to this degree of depth in your background. It's fascinating. <laughs> I want to bring it back now and talk about leading in Japan. So, you're with uh, Jack Welch's passion about Japan. Okay, Rick, get over there and get that business organized. So, at some point, you are in Japan leading a team, and probably uh, probably one of your early leadership experiences, I guess, even you know, as a professional. What were some things that you sort of were struck by when you started to lead a Japanese team? Because you're not Japanese, I'm not Japanese. How did you find what the differences, what some of the challenges to leading a team at that time? Yeah, there, there, there are a couple of things. First of all, with Teradyne, uh, our biggest competitor was a Japanese company, Advantest, a very good company. I think any company, to be a, a good company, you have to have a good competitor, and you should try to learn from your competitor. Sometimes your competitor is your best consultant. Uh, w with a, an American company in Japan, and these are all of the businesses I've been to are B2B, where you're selling to other companies, not selling to consumers. But, uh, so you have to build up the trust with your, your customers. Uh, the, the first thing, I, I think the, the standard of performance in Japan, the, the standard of performance for employees has to be, are we satisfying the customer? And uh, if, you, if you put the customer central to almost everything you do with, uh, with your sales force, with your, uh, your engineering group or whatever, Japanese get that, uh, and uh, Americans don't always get it. <laughs> Shareholder value, <laughs> Shareholder value, and and so forth. So, uh, putting the the customer at the center, I think, is uh, is one way to do it in Japan. the The other thing, though, is the Japanese employees have to have confidence in their. American employer, and with in the case of Teradyne, you know, if we're not bringing something extra to the customer that our Japanese competitor can't bring, and it's usually technology, uh, uh, and and performance. So understanding that performance and understanding how to sell it and making sure that if our performance is lacking that we get the feedback back to the engineering groups in the United States. So you know we want to make the experience for the customer to be as Japanese as it can be. The customer should be as comfortable with us as they are with our Japanese competitor and yet at the same time we have to have the 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 performance in our product uh, and you know that could partly be branding that's partly just trying to make sure how we get that across to the customer that we have uh, a performance advantage mm -hmm. but I can remember with uh, you know when you're working for an American company in Japan when I first started with Teradyne uh, even people at Teradyne would often say that they were they're an arrogant company. Uh, you know, the, one of the founders of Teradyne, uh, not the one. Well, one of the founders of Teradyne, uh, 
uh, said we don't have to listen to our customers because the customers only want yesterday's technology at cheaper prices. And so we're going to be ahead of our customers. Uh, and that, I can remember sitting with a very senior person at Mitsubishi, and they were absolutely dependent on us for one particular system that was key to their manufacturing. And, and I had to give him a message that we're not going to be able to deliver him exactly what he wanted. And the way I did it, he looked at me and he said, you're an American. I can only buy it from you, so I will buy it from you. But I hate buying from you. Oh. I said, ooh, 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 we gotta change this. Uh, you know, the Japanese had this idea of, of not product out, but market in. And so what do you mean by that, not product out, market in? So, uh, you know, actually when Teradyne went back in the 90s and sort of got the religion of, of Japanese, uh, Japanese approach to business. And we, a we actually brought over a professor to our uh, headquarters in Boston to do it. Uh, in a way, they were caricatures. But I, I can remember we were putting a large number of systems into a factory that Matsushita was building. And Matsushita, the way the pillars were in the factory, they wanted us to change the length of a particular cable on the system so that it would work around the... So, yeah. And the attitude in Teradyne was, well, change your pillars. <laughs> and, and that actually in Teradyne, when, uh, when they sort of got religion, even the the head of Teradyne, the founder of Teradyne, would say, there was a day when we would go to Matsusta and say, change your pillars. But we don't do that anymore. <laughs> we're going to listen to the customer. We're going to be accommodating to customers. Uh, so getting that, you know, that's, that's kind of a, uh, an extreme. But uh, we did have a culture change at Teradyne, and the culture change came from Japan, mainly because the Japanese market was so so important to Teradyne. So they learnt the importance of the customer at the centre of everything and changed what they were doing. And they changed what they were doing. As opposed they to, we'll changed just get you to the way those pillars, they were thinking. We'll actually change the cable. Right. Yeah, amazing. Th that made it much easier for those of us in Teradyne in Japan because now we could go back and, and uh, you know, really give the, the needs of the customer. Now, you, know, you, you have to do selling when you can't give the customer exactly what the customer wants. But uh, yeah, listening to the customer was, uh, is something that Americans, good American companies learn from Japan. And what about the team? You know, you've, you've got this team there. Uh, how do you get the team uh, to coalesce as a team to, uh, yes, they focus on the customer, but they've also got to um, work under you, they've got to work together, you've got to get them organised to be going in the same direction, give them the vision of where we're going with this, explain why we're doing things. Mm. How did you fit all those parts together? But, uh, one thing, and this is a, a, a simple thing, but... All the rest of Teradyne had uh, had sales commissions, but at Teradyne in Japan, we implemented team commissions. So, you know, there's a team working on Hitachi, a team working on NEC, and that the performance of that team would, there would be rewards uh, for all of them. Uh, I know that's, not done in all companies. When, when we broke off and had our own company, we did the same thing. So it wasn't just salesmen getting getting a getting a commission. And you did that for what reason? In order to avoid uh, it, it, it be, because it really is a team effort, and to avoid people thinking that the salespeople are really making a bundle, and the others who are doing hard work. Or not, 
so making sure that everybody is is clued in to, to what the customer wants. So it's really the, it's the group focus, isn't it, really? The classic Japanese group orientation right. and keeping that. Right, right. I, I'm also a, a big fan of a regular rhythm of communication. Uh, so, you know, whatever my staff is, having a weekly staff meeting, even if it's only 30 minutes, having a, a regularized agenda and, and giving feedback to the staff so that we're all sharing information and then try across a group to have a regular uh, a regular rhythm of communication so that people stick together. How many people were there at Teradyne at that point that you were looking after? Teradyne in Japan, what was, Teradyne in Japan, we had manufacturing in Kumamoto and so altogether, when I left Teradai in Japan, it was maybe 250 people. Mm -hmm. But then we also were, by that time, had a large operation in Korea, a large operation in Taiwan, a large operation in Southeast Asia, mainly sales and, and, uh, and applications engineering. So all of this communication across the region and also internally <coughs> with such a large number of people becomes important. So. What were some things you did to drive that communication apart from having those regular there's, meetings? There's regular agendas? rhythm, but you know what? Another, there are a couple of other things. The, uh, another tool that I think was very important that I learned from the Japanese approach to management was uh, it, uh, to get to get a group to uh, face their mistakes and learn from their mistakes. And uh, so in manufacturing, uh, especially in manufacturing, you, you, the, the, the thing that I think the world learned from Japan is that you're not trying to make the best product, you're trying not to make defective products. Mm -hmm. Uh, and that's, an, and that's the, the thing is, when you're thinking we're not going to make defective products, that becomes operational. That is, you can analyze your defects and then figure out what you're going to do about them. It's more of a Kaizen. It's a Kaizen, approach, right. Isn't? Exactly. So what the Japanese have taught us is how an organization can learn, not just how individual people can learn, but how an organization can learn. But you have to set up those processes so that you are learning. And that's not only for manufacturing, but also for the, for the back office as well. So, uh, so to have an organization that, uh, that will admit its, its mistakes. Also, another thing that I think we've learned from Japan that's extremely useful is when you communicate with each other in the company to communicate at the right level at the, of abstraction. And, this and are we talking communication in Japanese language now or English language? We're either way, abstraction. either way, or, or, or Chinese language or Korean language or Thai, mm -hmm. <laughs> that you're dealing at the right level of abstraction. What that, what that means is when when you're at a high level of abstraction, it becomes judgmental. So when you say uh, Tanaka-san doesn't care, you can't do anything about that. When you say Tanaka-san arrives five minutes late to all of the staff meetings, you can do something about that. Maybe he has a reason for coming five minutes late, whatever. Uh, but to, to extrapolate that to a high level of abstraction, it becomes judgmental, and, that, and you can only start a fight. <laughs> Tanaka-san, you don't care. I do care. <laughs> you can only start a fight. Tanaka-san, we noticed you always come five minutes late to the staff meeting, uh, and that's, you know, that, whatever, whatever. You can do something with that. So it, there, there are cases where you, you have to be uh, you, you, you know, uh, at a high level of abstraction. But in a company, generally, uh, it's 
better to communicate at a level of abstraction where you can do something about it and you're not judgmental. So in that sense too, you talk about argument, argumentation or whatever. Um, you've got 250 people, that's a pretty big organization, 300 people, whatever it is. You know, it's not very common in Japan that you start to get divisions which become chief terms, you know, of certain individuals, they're little empires and they start, you know, coalescing against each other and competing with each other in a very negative way. Did you ever have those experiences? Yeah. Uh, yeah I'm, I'm not sure if it's uh, unique to Japan, but there, you, you can get these sort of tribalistic uh, divisions in Japan. What do you do about uh, those? You um, can... <coughs> uh, for example... Uh, I, I've long managed uh, engineering groups, and engineers can be very difficult to manage. <laughs> they can be Pollyannas, and uh, uh, they have, and and they often say they have a hard time communicating with each other. Often, you know, people who are not uh, who who are good at at uh, you know at RF engineering are not necessarily good at communicating with each other. Uh, and you you can find those uh, those sort of tribalistic groups among engineering groups. I th I think there too. Uh, you know, people will have their friendships uh, and uh, whatever. But to get them to be more inclusive, first of all, in engineering, I think it's really important to have regular regularized engineering reviews. So that and to have that be routine, so that engineers don't mind having it's a routine. So they they'll open up and not mind having other people review their work, and then you and then to make it on a on a meaningful level. There's in general in Japan the uh, you know. Going out as a group, having uh, various kinds of group sessions, having uh, you know a a softball team or a, a volleyball team, and uh, to get people out. Did you have a this. softball team or a volleyball team in the company? Yeah, we did. We had a volleyball team. I'm not well. I'm I'm okay at softball, but yeah, <laughs> and uh, yeah. Uh, and to have group activities like that. If you want to be successful as a leader, do the Leadership Training for Managers course. All companies need people who can both manage and lead. Leading people screams out for real skills in communication, dealing with all different types of people, being excellent at innovation, planning, delegation, handling mistakes, doing performance reviews really well, and inspiring and motivating the team. Do the Leadership Training for Managers course now in either Japanese or English. Your role as a leader, how did you fit into all that, those social activities? I mean, you know, how did that work? I, uh, I, I usually tried to participate in some, uh, say, large group social activities, maybe once a quarter or so. Uh, and, uh, you know, I... I had my presence in the office, uh, so uh, and and also in our in our China office, and uh, and then when I had the the operation in Thailand in Thailand. One thing I know the the podcast is about leadership in Japan, but one thing I found. Uh, particularly a challenge was to take the Japanese concept of Kaizen and quality control uh, to China and to Thailand. Because in China, there's, uh, especially, they're, they're much more sensitive about face and so much more reluctant to admit uh, mistakes. 
And in Thailand, I can remember, I mean, here we had a factory of 5,000 people. We, we rebuilt at one point our, our ladies' less, most of them were lady, our ladies' restroom. So we demolished the ladies' room. We built a nice new ladies' restroom. When we demolished the old ladies' restroom, we found uh, a whole pool full of defective materials. They, they were taking defective material from the production line and throwing it down the toilet. Uh, to hide the mistakes. To hide the mistakes. Exactly. Right. Exactly. And uh, I, I can remember early on when I was doing my PhD thesis, I was doing a lot of interviews at Sony and what then was their very early semiconductor operation in Ibuka, Ibuka, even though he was he was chairman emeritus, uh, one of the founders of Sony. Ibuka yeah. and, and Morita were the two Morita, founders yeah. of Sony. Ibuka was still very active, and he was he was in the office all the time. You go in to see Ibuka, and he, he gave me a lot of his time for interviews. On top of his desk, he always had piles of semiconductors, and they were all defective. And he said, "These are my treasures. If I understand what's going on in these defective materials, I can improve my yields." So I, I, you know, I called the Thai team together. We don't throw away bad material. Those are our treasures. Yeah. Which we, they would never think of it like that. They would never think of it like that. They were hiding it. Uh, and, you know, no, we analyze that. It, it, we learn from our mistakes. Were the Japanese receptive to learning from those errors and not hiding them? Because, you know, Japan's a mistake-free zone, defect-free zone. I, I think... You know, I, I spent a lot of time in training courses in Japan on quality control. I really think that in the 1950s, what Japan developed in how to, manufa how to manage manufacturing was a system that, that, conf that, that confronts all of the problems of Japanese society. Get people to admit their mistakes. Mistakes are good. Uh, defective material is your treasure. It, that that a lot of that goes against mm. Japanese culture, and yet you know. So it was like a it was like a, a cultural revolution. I don't think this comes from the Japanese DNA. I think mm. that uh, it was systematically taught, even that a sort of Deming's uh, system. You yeah, think? I think they took Deming and they took it one step further and made it into a, a social movement. A religion almost. A religion, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and what about coming back to things, you know, for example, um, getting innovation is very important in any business, particularly in manufacturing. How did you encourage innovation in the teams, amongst your teams in Japan? Innovation... Uh, first of all, uh, Japanese, you know, we, we might think of them as not being innovative. They, uh, they are innovative. I think, sort of taking it another way, sort of taking it backwards, uh, looking at large companies like NEC, uh, Hitachi, uh, Fujitsu, uh, because so many very good engineers in Japan are working in large companies. Large companies are not very good at innovation. Mm -hmm. And often they, they kill innovation. Why? Why is that? I think, and I don't think that's unique to Japan. I think it's, I think it's true, it can be true in the, uh, the United States as well. Uh, So, at Teradyne, when Teradyne got big, uh, and, uh, and the senior management, including me, thought that it was being less innovative, what they started to do was to take engineering groups and put them 20 miles away from the home office, put them in an isolated setting and to work on a problem and try to get them out of, out of the home office. And 
Did it work? It, it, that worked. That worked. In many ways, it was very successful. They even sort of treated it like a like a startup company. Type so of skunk, skunk work type like of thing. a skunk work kind of thing. So they would have a board of directors, maybe, hmm. and they would fund it, uh, and then sort of treat it like a startup company. They would also reward like a startup company, uh, so that you know if it was successful, there there. More companies are doing this in the States now. Uh, Cisco is one where, you know, Cisco has really grown by acquiring a lot of companies. Now, what does that say to your internal engineers who are trying to do it internally? So uh, Cisco and other companies now will send them out to start up their company and then Cisco will buy it back virtually. Uh, and so you get the reward that you get with the uh, American startup culture. And were they able to transfer that, um, establish a operation outside of the home office concept in Japan to also get innovation? I think the, I, it, it's, it's starting to happen in Japan. There's, there's more interest in it in Japan. And, and also Jap Japanese companies are getting more of what they call open innovation, where they're working, say, with startups in the States or something. I, uh, but how to make Japan more innovative, I think, is, is a real issue. Uh, I'm involved with two universities. I'm involved with Hiroshima University and Kyushu University in uh, trying to promote more relationship between industry and the university. And in, in my PhD thesis, this is one of the things I actually wrote about was Japanese universities and industry. And when I was writing my thesis, uh, uh, professors at universities cooperating with a, with a private company was almost a taboo. And that was partly because of the war and uh, that Japanese professors, academics were no longer going to be contaminated. Uh, by the commercial world or, or whatever. That taboo is, is long since gone. But Japanese universities are so siloed. It is so amazing. In what way? So, for example, I latched on to a professor who's from the Rigakubu, the science faculty in Hiroshima University, who has what looks like a really innovative idea for how to make a memory device. And he's very, he, he, he's very creative. He's young. Uh, he's arrogant. <laughs> but he, he, he's, he's very bright. So, you know, ask you, have, have you measured do you have this kind of instrument to measure this? Well, no, but they probably have it over in the Kogakubu. Well, we don't communicate with the Kogakubu. Oh, okay. <laughs> and, and so I, I took and him... the Kogakubu is the engineering department. And the Kogakubu is the engineering department, and he's in the science faculty. And, and they're totally different. They actually have, in Hiroshima University, a semiconductor fab. So they have an ability to make prototype semiconductors, but that's in the engineering faculty. And he's in the science faculty. I took him to, I, I won't name the name of the company, but to Japan's premier semiconductor capital equipment company in Tokyo. And we just, uh, I, I set up this and got him with the best engineers at this. And he explained what he was doing. And, and uh, you know, they were very interested. There might be something here. And even they said, have you talked to this other professor? No, he's in the Kogakubu. They said, OK, we're going to come down to Hiroshima University. This is a company. We're going to come down to Hiroshima University. We're going to introduce you <laughs> oh, wow. to this professor in the engineering faculty. And, you know, it's this Hiroshima University, Kyushu University, they're so siloed. Mm. And the output is papers. Mm. It's so different than talking to professors at MIT or Stanford. But, you know, equally bright people, but it's a, they're working in a different framework, a, a different, uh, you know, uh, their goals are different, their outputs are different.
And the opportunity cost of that yes. across all across breadth of universities all in the country across all Japanese universities is, is huge. staggering. It's staggering. Wow. It's staggering. There is so many there's so many good ideas that just go for naught because yeah, it's And the country really can't afford that. The country cannot anymore. afford it. The country mm-hmm. cannot afford it. The country cannot afford it. Let me let me just switch subjects a little bit to um, it's sort of related in a way around trust. Obviously, there's no trust between these silos, but right. within the companies you run here, how did you generate a sense of they could trust you as a leader, and how did you get trust from them? Uh, trying to be open, uh, trying to be honest, trying to you know to admit what I don't know, and to be open to learning from the employees. Uh, I think that's that's just sort of my style. So, uh, and I think that works in Japan. Mm. Uh, that's that's a big part of it, and it works in China and works in Thailand too. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I'm sure it does. Yeah. So, we've asked you know I've asked you a number of questions around leading in Japan. Are there any things around leading in Japan that I should have asked you that I haven't asked? Um, one thing that that uh, that I'm I'm sort of focusing on right now for Japan. It's it's uh, looking at the companies that we have spun out from Japanese companies. I, I notice on on your podcast, you you make a distinction between management and leadership, mm-hmm. and. Uh, the people who come out of large Japanese companies, uh, I have come to the conclusion that most of them don't know how to run a business. They know how to run an operation. They can run an operation. Japanese companies are very good at setting the annual budget, the set, uh, annual operation goals. They have KPI and they have all of this, uh, but running, managing that and managing a business is different. Mm. Uh, managing a business is, you know, the environment changes, things change. Uh, you have to be able to figure out what your ultimate goal is and then and then be flexible to change. Uh, so that's, that I think, you know, in talking to the people at uh, at Hitachi, or talking to people that we we uh, uh, from the companies that we've acquired at Japan Industrial Partners, uh, that's a real part of it. But then, so you have to you have to really teach people how to how to run a business. The other thing, and that that part that you're teaching them, what is that part that they need to learn? I think they they have to they have to learn more than their specific discipline. They have to learn about finance. They uh, they have to learn about uh, return. What's what's the right return? They have to uh, things like like value pricing. Uh, they have to learn I, uh, sales. I think and customer relations is always the center of business. In Japanese companies they're renowned for this circulation of people through the different aspects of the company so that you've got the generalist at the end who's really a specialist of nothing but has been in the HR department, has been in the export department, has been in sales, has been in whatever, you know. So they, they usually have that, big companies have that pattern. Is that not achieving it? For, no, no. For the most part, I think that's, that's, uh, that's one of the big weaknesses of large Japanese companies. Uh, you know, the the people that I associate with at Hitachi Chemicals, uh, the, all of the outside directors are on the audit committee, and we're supposed to audit all of the operations worldwide. So I'm constantly traveling around to uh, Hitachi Chemicals <coughs> operations. It's a fascinating thing. I'm learning a lot. Most of the people that I work with uh, are all Tanshin Funin. 
they are all living separate from their families because they're on constant rotation. That is, in Japan, they're in constant rotation. That means they're moving them from one factory to another? One they're moving from another. one factory to another, and so their family might be an Ibaragi mm -hmm. prefecture, because Hitachi is originally an Ibaragi. So maybe they joined an Ibaragi, and their their family, their wife, their, or, or, or you know, mo most of them are male. Uh, and so they're living away from their families. The, if I look at how... Uh, you, you, you go to a sales office, like in Sapporo, for example. And, uh, you know, I, I'm talking to the sales manager in Sapporo. I'm saying, have you, have, you, have you been to that company in Hakodate? That's an interesting company. I think there's a possibility there. And have you met so-and-so in Hakodate? Uh, you say, no. I've only been here for two years, and he might call his secretary and say, <laughs> do you know this company? How could I? He, he talks to one of the local employees uh, because the, the, the proper employees are on this constant rotation. The, the two most powerful sections of most large Japanese companies are the Jinjibu, the HR department, HR department, because they're the ones who choreograph the rotations, <laughs> and the planning division <laughs> in the central office, yeah. because they're making up all the budgets mm -hmm. and all of this. Uh, and the individual people at the factories or in sales or whatever are working according to the annual plan and are ready to pull up stakes and go to their next assignment in three years, four I years. See. Now, one thing that's changing in Japan is 70% of Hitachi's business is outside of Japan, and 70% of our employees are outside of Japan. So I go to the office, say, in Chengdu, in Sichuan, or I go to the one in Jungqing, or, or go to the one in Suzhou, and we've done a good job at the overseas offices. Or in San Jose, for example, we've done a good job at the overseas office. In Chengdu, we might hire Japanese-speaking Chinese employees who went to school at Chuo Daigaku or Itsumeikan or something. They can speak Japanese. But they're from Chengdu, and they want to live in Chengdu. Mm -hmm. And as long as there's a Hitachi office in Chengdu, that's where they want to be. And if Hitachi moves out of Chengdu, they'll go to another company, <laughs> preferably a Japanese company. They're local employees. They know, they know the local companies. They have all the network. And you go to the Hitachi office in uh, Aichiken, in Nagoya. And we actually get complaints from Denso and Toyota that we only leave our employees there, our salespeople there, for three years. But the average project span in, a, in an automotive company is five years. So we're transferring them out before, well, the mid-project. But you go to the sales office of a foreign company, like Infineon. The sales manager for Infineon in Nagoya, I think she's a lady, actually. She's from Nagoya. She's been with Infineon for 20 years. She knows all of the people in Denso. She knows all the people in Toyota. She knows all of her customers. She has a sales force that's local and knows all of their customers. There was a day when this worked for a Japanese company, this constant rotation mm -hmm. and making generalists. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, th I, I think that it's, uh, it's no longer, I think it's dysfunctional. If we had to give someone who's being assigned uh, posting in Japan some advice, maybe three pieces of advice. They're about to arrive in Japan. They don't know Japan. And you're going to give them three pieces of advice. What would be those three pieces of advice you'd give them? I, I guess the first piece of advice is... Uh, is uh, be ready and willing to learn from Japan. 
don't come feeling that uh, that you know it, but be ready and willing to to listen. But at the same time, uh, have if you're coming on overseas assignment to Japan, you also have to have you have to bring something to the job which say a Japanese manager can't bring to the job. Uh, and while being humble and willing to listen, you, you have to figure out what you can do that a, that a Japanese manager can't do. Obviously, the thing you bring is, is the ability to communicate and, and get response from your home office. Uh, but there can be, there can be other things in too. You, you, you have to have something. <laughs> and uh, so you know, there's, there's still a lot that, that, uh, that Japan can learn from, uh, from, from those people who are coming from, from the home office. So figure out what that is. What's the third piece of advice? If there is a third piece, if not there, required. If <laughs> there is, if there is. I guess one thing is, uh, if it's a B two B kind of business, uh, you know, spend time with your customers, even if there's a language barrier. Uh, spend time with your customer. I don't, I don't play golf very well, but you know, if you play golf, uh, that can be valued. Whatever you can do to build up relations with the customers, so that they also know that you are you're bringing something to to their game. Uh, you know, learn what learn what their problems are, and learn learn how you might be able to solve them. Should thank you very much. This thank has you. been <laughs> fabulous. <laughs> yeah. Thank, Thank you very you. much for joining us for this most recent episode of Japan's Top Business Interviews. And please join us for our next episode. Thank you very much.